Welcome to Hope Sabbath School, an in-depth, interactive study of the Word of God. I'm glad you joined us today as we continue an amazing series on family seasons, different places in our journey. Today, our house is a place of hospitality and witness. The question, what have they seen in your house? You say, where did we get that title? Well, stay with us. You'll see a king who made a foolish mistake. Mm. God wants our homes to be a place to witness about Him. Mm. We're glad you joined us today. Great series of studies. Yeah. And I must admit, today's study is thinking about what they see in my house. That's really personal, right? Mm -hmm. That's getting really practical. And we're praying that you'll be blessed wherever you are as you think about what people will see in your home. We're praying they'll see God lifted up. Amen? Amen. Amen. Here's some notes. Kenna Leone from Botswana writes and says, The Lord used Hope TV to win me to His eternal kingdom. Amen. 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 It brings me to tears that the Lord could do such wonderful things for me. Amen. First, when I joined the church, I struggled to understand the Bible study, but thanks to Hope Sabbath School, I started to have an idea how it works. Amen. <laughs> now I'm confident to stand in class and share my views in front of the people. Amen. Amen. God bless Hope Channel. We say, Kenna Leone, God bless you too there in Botswana. Thanks for writing. Here's a beautiful note. This is actually a handwritten letter. I'm not going to read it all. But it's from a donor who said, I want to help the Ministry of Hope Channel. I'm writing this letter today to tell you how much I appreciate Hope Sabbath School and the Hope Channel. It has literally saved my life with God. Amen. Amen. And that donor, thank you so much from the state of Illinois, sent a gift of $1,000 to help the ministry of Hope Channel. But more valuable than that is saving our life with God, right? Amen. Amen. And I think our team here, including me, we could testify that being part of Hope Sabbath School has also saved our lives with God, right? Amen. Keeping us close to Jesus. I pray that that's your experience too. Angelita, thanks for writing from Texas in the United States. I enjoy watching Hope Sabbath School every week. I look forward to watching as early as Monday or Tuesday of each week. Sometimes there may be a few things I don't get as I study on my own, but I make sure I study before watching Hope Sabbath School. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Mm. God bless everyone that's helping in any way or form to be such a great blessing. Please pray for my husband that he may want to attend church with me soon. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to tell you, we're talking today about making our homes a place of hospitality and witness. When we are connected to the power of heaven, people around us will be blessed, right? Yes. But Angelita, we will certainly be praying for you and for your family. Teresa writes from Zambia and says, I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Greetings. Amen. Amen. That was pretty weak. <laughs> I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Greetings. I'm pleased to inform you that Hope Sabbath School is really touching my life in a positive way as I prepare for the soon coming of Jesus. Amen. Stay blessed, Teresa says, and we say stay blessed to you, Teresa. Thanks for being part of our Hope Sabbath School family. One last note from Desmond. Nicole, there are just so many in Jamaica. I don't know. Uh, we must have tens of thousands, and they're all Hopefully. Uh, happy <laughs> to have uh, a representative on the team. My name is Desmond from Jamaica. I've been watching Hope Sabbath School since I gave my heart to Jesus three years ago. Amen. Amen. I just want to share with you how much Hope Sabbath School has changed me and my entire family. We all were baptized together. Amen. I pray that God will continue to bless this ministry. People need to know the love of Jesus. May the good Lord bless you all. Amen. 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 Well, thank you so much, Desmond. And what an amazing thing. His whole family gave their hearts to Jesus together. We're just so glad. And what a beautiful introduction to our study today about making our homes a place of hospitality and witness. But before we go into our study... We have a 3,000-year-old song to sing, Praise Him in the Heights. If you enjoy it, sing along with us. Oh, 
You know, I remember complaining one time. I said, Lord, do I have to sing in front of people? And the Spirit of God rebuked me and said, you still don't understand, Derek, do you? It's not about you. Mm -hmm. And if tens of thousands of people around the world can be lifting their hearts in praise to God, the angels of God would say, Amen. Amen. Or maybe, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> praise the Lord, right? As we join together. And today, as we look at this beautiful topic, it could seem like a bit of a rebuke. Uh, an ancient king made a foolish mistake. But we can learn from our mistakes mm -hmm. and we can say, Lord, let my home, very humble maybe or very spacious, whatever it is, let it be a place where you are lifted up. Amen. Let's pray as we study today. Father in heaven, we thank you that we can learn lessons from your word to help us today. And we, we've studied about different seasons in the family, but now how our homes can be a place of hospitality and witness. Guide us in our study, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 What have they seen in your house? Well, let's go to an ancient story. And Kyle, if you could begin our study today, we're in 2 Chronicles chapter 32. And the king's name is Hezekiah. Now, Hezekiah did some good things during his reign. But this particular story... Um, well, let's see what he does. We're in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, and let's look at verses 27 through 29. See how God has blessed this king. Okay. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Hezekiah had very great riches and honor, and he made himself treasuries for silver, for gold, for precious stones, for spices, for shields, and for all kinds of desirable items storehouses for the harvest of grain, wine, and oil, and stalls for all kinds of livestock, and folds for flocks. Moreover, he provided cities for himself, and possessions of flocks and herds in abundance, for God had given him very much property. Mm. Do you see any kind of slight warning red flag at all in what Kyle just read from Second Chronicles? Mm. Anybody? Yes. That he made for himself. Ah, there's just a little clue there, isn't it? It kind of reminds us of that story about the rich fool who said, I want to build a bigger barn, mm -hmm. rather than saying, is there any of my neighbors? Do you need anything? Mm -hmm. Right? Some of them would have come forward. Or could I make my home a place of hospitality for those who don't have as much? So there's a little red flag there. Thanks for catching that. Let's look at the testimony of the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 39. Malena, if you have that, would read it for us. The first five verses. Now, again, if this is not be mean to Hezekiah Day, okay? <laughs> but this story is included for our admonition or learning, isn't it? <laughs> Let's see what happens uh, according to the prophet Isaiah, chapter 39, verses 1 to 5. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. 
At that time, Merodach Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that he had been sick and had recovered. And Hezekiah was pleased with them and showed them the house of his treasures, the silver and gold, the spices and precious ointment, and all his armory, all that was, all that was found among his treasures. There was nothing in his house or in all his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say, and from where did they come to you? So Hezekiah said, They came to me from a far country, from Babylon. And he said, What have they seen in your house? So Hezekiah answered, They have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not shown them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming. Sorry. Well, you could go on and read the rest of the story. What is the rest of the story, by the way, Kyle? Well, it says here that, um, of course, Isaiah told him that Babylon would come and take all this stuff away. That's right. That's right. Now, there was nothing wrong in the emissaries coming, right? In fact, they brought a gift because they heard what? He was sick. He was sick. Mm -hmm. That is a perfect opportunity, Renella. Mm -hmm when they come and, and bring a gift saying, mm -hmm. we heard you were sick, to say what? To tell them about the God of heaven. That's right. And say, thank you for your kindness. And the prayers of God's people were heard, mm -hmm. and I have recovered, right? Mm -hmm. What's in your house? The answer is God, God is in my house, right? Mm -hmm. And we just want to give him glory. So what's driving him, Tom? I mean, you're like, hello, he doesn't know these people. What do you think is driving his behavior that he would show them? I mean, he says everything. There was nothing that I didn't show them. Well, it seems like a little pride and maybe forgetting to give credit to God. Right. You know? <laughs> there isn't anywhere there where he says, there's a lot of things, but I want to tell you, God bless me. Mm. Of course, to show a stranger from another land everything you've got probably isn't that smart anyway, is yeah. it? <laughs> yeah. You wonder if he prayed yeah. and said, Lord, what would you like me to show him? Mm -hmm. you know, could I take him to the temple and see people praying? What, what should I show him? Yes. It's clear that he's, um, he's trying to boast about what he has because he says, I showed them all my treasures. Ah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So there's these little clues here, right? I'm thinking of the Old Testament passage which says, when you come into the land, you know, and you prosper, don't forget. Mm. Right. Yeah. Right? It is the Lord your God who gives you power to give wealth. That's right. And so I want to say, God, I want to give you all that glory. Now, how does that relate to us? How many of you here of the 12 are wealthy? Don't raise your hands. Because <laughs> that's really not the issue, is it? Right. No. Right. You could actually be impoverished and brag about the things you have. That's true. Mm. That's true. Or you could be incredibly wealthy and your home could be a place of hospitality and witness. So let's continue in our study. We've learned a lesson from King Hezekiah. Like Kyle said, uh, the day would come when the people of Babylon, the armies, would take all of those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about our homes not being a showcase of our possessions, mm. but a place of hospitality and witness. So I want you to do a scan. You ready? Do a scan of your Bible knowledge and say, who do I know in the Bible that used their home as a place of hospitality and witness. Who jumps to your mind? Chelsea. I think of Abraham when those three strangers came to his okay. home and he did not hesitate to give them the best that he had to offer. Right, he kind of almost pled with them to stay by, didn't right, he? Right, yes. And by the way, who were those three strangers? Angels. Angels. They were heavenly message, messengers, right? And, and then there is a text in Hebrews chapter 13 says, don't be forgetful to... Mm entertain strangers mm -hmm. or show hospitality. Mm -hmm. Some have entertained angels. angels unawares. Well, that was one of the yep. yeah. great illustrations, Chelsea. Another story, Kyle? I think of the home of Mary and Martha yeah. and Lazarus. Oh, that's just a great one in the ministry of Jesus, right, isn't it? Right, right. They were always inviting him to come and rest and give him food, and it was just a place where Jesus could rest. Yeah. Normally we read that story and we're a little negative about Martha being so busy. But you have to admit, she wanted her home to be right. a place of hospitality. Right. Mm -hmm. She just needed to slow down a little, Martha. <laughs> yeah. You know, don't forget to sit at the feet of Jesus. Yeah. Great, great story. Haiti. I think of the couple that made a room for the prophet Elisha. Mm. Ah, okay. That was the Shunammite woman, right? That mm -hmm. finally had a child. She made a room like a guest room mm -hmm. for the prophet Elisha, right? Elisha. 
Yeah, that's another great one showing hospitality. Pedro? Well, one that we don't notice much is uh, the house of Mary, mother of Mark. He, she was the one who hosts okay. most of the disciples in Jerusalem. Yeah, mm. that's right. In fact, isn't that where Peter goes when he's released from prison yes. mm. and they won't open the door when he's knocking on it, right? But they came there to pray. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was a place a of prayer. hospitality yeah. and, and actually witness, wasn't it? Yeah. Travis? I think in Acts chapter 16 of the jailer, hmm. after he hmm. was converted, invited Paul and Silas into his house and, and cleaned them up and fixed them up and served them. Okay, so a very new follower of Jesus. Mm -hmm. There's another one of the disciples who was a very new follower of Jesus who opened up his home. Who was that? Matthew. Someone say Matthew for me. Thank you, Pedro. <laughs> That's right. Matthew, Matthew. And who does he invite? Tax collectors. Tax collectors. Yeah, the IRS, you know, if you live in the U.S. or whatever they call it where you live, the tax collector agency. He invited all of his tax collector friends. Why? To impress them with how mm, successful the they've been? To share, to share the gospel. He wanted them to meet Jesus, right? Amen. And hear what Jesus had done. So I want you to think about your own life now because we all have journeys. And think of a time when someone showed Christian hospitality to you. They opened their home to you and, and it blessed you. Chelsea? Yes. I can think of um, when I was in my preteen, early teen years. Um, and there was this one Sabbath school teacher who just really had a heart for my age group. And she would open her home for Vespers, for just hanging out for all these different things. And I really feel like she was integral in helping me grow in God mm -hmm. just from her own hospitality and caring for preteens and early teens. Is she still alive? Yes, she is. I hope she watches Hope Sabbath School. I hope so. Because she may not be thinking, I'm going to really make a deep impression on Chelsea. Yeah. She's just saying, God, I just want my home to be a place of hospitality and witness, right? Right. Thank you for sharing that. Someone else, uh, someone that that impacted you, Nicole? Well, a number of years ago, I actually was traveling to Bali, Indonesia. And on my way, I left my passport at home. And so I had to stop over in Guam. And um, I had to wait for my passport to come to me. And when I got to Guam, a young lady who I'd never met before, I don't even remember her name, but she kind of saw me in the airport and I was kind of, you know, disgusted by the fact that I was going to be staying there. But she welcomed me to her home. She helped me find a hotel to stay in overnight, and she brought me to her church. She wasn't an Adventist, but she was definitely a Christian woman. Mm. Oh, man. And even to this day, I remember that she really helped me those two days I spent in Guam just being there for me. Mm. I never knew her. I don't know who she so is So that day. was both hospitality oh, and mm -hmm. witness. witness, right? Yeah. It's true. It's powerful. True. Thank you for sharing. Tom. Yeah, my wife and I were traveling, same thing, but we got stuck on a Friday evening because every, all the airports were shut down due to a blizzard. And so we went to church the next day and uh, at a local church, and I think it was uh, Houston, Texas. And so we were talking about how we were stuck. And this couple nearby says, are you guys, do you guys need a place to stay? And I said, we said, yeah, yeah, we do. <laughs> and so they invited us over, uh, offered us food. And if they're watching, by the way, uh, we haven't <laughs> forgot that years later. Uh, yeah. Uh, but they were really just, it just spoke to us about like a church family, wherever we go, mm -hmm. there's people who can take us in. Mm -hmm. We probably could spend the whole time. And that's not a bad thing to, to honor those people whether in an airport or during early teen years or some, someone in the midst of some inclement weather. And just say thank you. It made a difference mm -hmm. uh, to my life because you showed hospitality. So maybe someone's listening, Haiti, and they say, Derek, I have a very modest home. I mean, you know, this is not like come over to my home. You know, first of all, that's a problem, right? That attitude. But let's say they say, you know, I, I have... I mean, I'm, maybe I'm single, I just have a little efficiency, or I don't have a lot of room. Really? You want me to just open the doors? As, what would you say to that person? Um, I actually have a friend who has come over to my house a few times and keeps telling me that, that she wants to invite me to her house, but that it's very small. <laughs> um, but her personality to me is just all that matters. And so I would say that let your uh, life be a light and an example of God and it, everything else. It won't matter how big it is, how fancy it is. Mm. If you have, you know, the best food there, a feast, 
That's what will make someone feel warm and welcome. Amen. 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 My wife and I, when we first moved to this part of the country, we stayed in a very small condo. And we really couldn't invite all of you over. <laughs> You'd have to come in shifts, right? Because it's very small. God has blessed us since to be in a setting where we have more room. But it's, it's not the number of people you can fit in either, is it? Maybe you can only invite two people. But those two people, just like your testimonies, could be impacted forever, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I like what you said, Haiti. You know, it's about what God's doing in you mm -hmm. right. that's important and not what people see. Now, it would be nice if it was clean, right? <laughs> right? Yes. If it was appropriate, but that is what leaves an impression. Like, I doubt if Chelsea would say, and I remember this lady, she was the sharpest dressed lady. <laughs> you may not even remember that, you know, right. but you remember her heart. Mm -hmm. right. Exactly. And that's what makes the difference. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to turn the story around and say a time when God impressed you to open maybe your little condo or your big house or whatever and say, Renella, can you think of a time God said, I want you to show hospitality and, and, and a witness to someone in your home? Yeah, you know, um, when I was in my early 20s, I lived in a studio. So it was a one, one, uh, it wasn't even a bedroom. It was just, you one know, room. one room. And I had a, a lot of younger girls, uh, you know, that were also around the same age, but that kind of looked up to me that wanted to spend time with me. And I, I thought, well, I don't know if I should invite them over. But I remember saying, you know what, they just want to spend time. And we had them come over and... I've just had such great deep talks where they could open up. And I think that's the thing is people open up when they're in your home, yeah. mm -hmm. in that that's intimate one-on-one. -on -one. And we were able to talk about God and just be able to encourage. And, um, and it, was, it was all worth it, even though I, nothing was great in, in my house. But I was able to, to be a blessing to them. And yeah. in an apartment, that small one room, everybody gets a front row seat. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, you, can, you don't hide in the back somewhere. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Great illustration. And, and I'm sure that just like some of these other stories, yes. some of those young people would say, I remember that time mm -hmm. that Renella invited me over. Someone else, a time when you were given the opportunity. Stephanie? Yeah, so I love having people over to my place, but I usually have a small, a very small place. And um, each time I invite someone home from church, it's, I'm the one that gets the blessing mm. because they're sharing their testimony. And it doesn't have to be that, that big or fancy. Um, soup and a sandwich is mm. great, but we always have great fellowship. So step out, Amen. Mm -hmm. do something out of your zone. So you've raised another uh, issue and that is, does God want us to be a blessing to others? Yes. 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 But what did you discover? I received the blessing. Yeah, the blessing comes back Amen. to you too. I think you, know, you felt the same way. Someone else, a time that God said, hey, I know you don't know these people, or maybe you weren't even planning on this, but I want you to open up your home and make it not a place, not, not a, like a museum tour or a treasury tour <laughs> like King Hezekiah, but a place of hospitality and witness. Travis? Yeah, I remember we had a, a truck driver delivering to our, our shop um, when I was in business and it was late at night that he was going to be coming in and I knew that he'd been traveling for a long time and I said, listen, wh why don't you come, I'll come and pick you up, why don't you come stay at my house? And I'll cook you supper and... Do you cook? I do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so That's I, even more special, right, when someone cooks for you. So I made him supper and found out that he is a, a nice Christian man. And we actually went in the living room around the fire. And we, we just studied the Bible for a couple hours together. It was something? a great That's experience. Awesome. Yeah, he couldn't believe that, that I invited him into, into my home. Wow. But uh, we had a great experience. Mm, so. so you're listening. You're going, well, that's beautiful. I'm a little more reserved. Um, I don't typically do that. You know, let them, let them go to Renella's house <laughs> or somewhere. Um, what would you say to a person that says, you know, I'd like, I'd like my home to be more a place of hospitality and witness, but, but I'm just a little reserved about that. Mm -hmm. Sean? Um, the one thing I would say is sometimes you have to build up to it. Okay. They may not, the first place may not be your home, but spending time with that person yeah. in any location, just mm -hmm. building that relationship could lead up to you inviting them to your house. Because once they know that you have 
you that you have their best interests in mind, mm -hmm. no strings attached, okay. then they're going to be more open to actually coming over and hanging out with you. So Sean's saying uh, one little step might be, hey, do you want to meet at uh, that ve vegetarian restaurant down the road? <laughs> you know, and uh, we could maybe have a little lunch together. Uh, that that you could build some more trust and, and they, they know that you're not strange or something. Got several hands. I want to hold them because it's practical. We'll come back after Kyle. I just want to agree with Sean. And actually, in my situation, I actually don't have a house that I can invite people to. I have a room. <laughs> don't want to invite people to just a tiny little room. And there may be people that don't have a place that they can invite people to. And that's okay. But you can go out of your way to show love to someone and, like Sean said, take them out to eat or just spend, spend time with them. Show them you know, that you care about them. I think that's what really matters the most. And mm -hmm. you could tell them, someday when I have a place, yeah. I'll invite you over. <laughs> someday I'm going to invite you all over. <laughs> and I won't cook because I can't cook like Travis. We had several you know. heads raised in the front. Uh, yes, Gary. Uh, uh, I was going to say um, one step also, if you're reserved, start with those closest to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, because if you're, if you're not used to having people over, you may not know what you're doing or you may not you, you want to feel like I'm okay with this this is fine and then as you you know you have the Holy Spirit lead you into oh invite that person you have that confidence saying I've done this before I can do it again mm -hmm. let me do it right okay. so rather than invite your entire office over <laughs> you might just have a friend that you work with yeah and say hey would you like to come over and, and have lunch Mm -hmm. one day on the weekend or whatever. Yeah. And uh, obviously we want to keep boundaries in terms of, you know, who it is and we don't want them to think we're wanting to have a date with them or something, <laughs> yeah. you know. We may want be better to invite two people over, right? Yeah. So, but we don't have to invite all 20 first time, right, Thomas? I, I was just thinking that hospitality is more than just whether you have a, a home to share. I'm thinking mm -hmm. of Luke 7 where Jesus was in the home of, I think it was Simon, and he says, you know, I came into your home and yet you didn't give me a kiss. But look at this woman over here, you know, right. she greeted me. And I think that shows us that hospitality is so much more. You can have a invite people into your home, but actually not be hospitable. Correct. <laughs> Correct. And and uh, and you can have a very simple home and be very warm and hospitable, too. Right. Well, let's talk about let's get now into the people in the house, because the Bible, when we talk about our home being a place of witness, <laughs> Our first mission field, hmm. our first mission field is where? Family. 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 Now, uh, if you happen to live by yourself, I guess you'd say, well, make sure I'm staying close to Jesus. But if we have others in the house, well, let's remind ourselves in some instruction. Stephanie, could you look at Acts 1, verse 8? Uh, we may read it, just do, 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 do. But I want you to notice the first place that you're to focus and how it expands out in bigger and bigger circles. All right, and I'll be reading from the King James Version. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't say they start at home, but Jerusalem is where? Capital. Where they are. Yeah. Yeah. That's where they are. Uh, Judea, that's kind of like if, if we live in this country, we might say the, the city and then the state, okay. or in some County. countries it might say the, the town and then the province, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, Samaria? Mm. A little beyond their community. Yes, and kind of a little bit outside of their culture too, right? right? right. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like, whoa, we're going to go that far? Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then? The all the earth. Earth. Then all the earth. Now, we could have a whole study about mission, and that would be really powerful. But we're talking here that the mission field begins in Jerusalem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So even if we didn't want to get too personal, we would say, I really ought to start praying that God would help me impact people for yeah. Christ within mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. sphere. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. In the place I live, right? Yeah. That's where I work, where I go to school, mm -hmm. uh, where my neighbors live. That's where I should start. But if I kind of tighten the circle down even more, it begins in my own oh, home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, I've heard people say, I don't want to be out telling the world about Jesus and Ooh. not tell my own family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does, that, does that make yeah. sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. I know some of you have testified about how important you feel that is. Can you think of um, 
some early followers of Jesus, like the first thing they did was not, let me go to the seven churches of Asia Minor. No, but they went right to their own family. Gary? Oh, I was going to say, uh, was, was it Andrew? It was Andrew. Andrew. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. What's the first thing that Andrew does? By the way, he was a disciple of John the Baptist, mm -hmm. right? right? And when Andrew and John yeah. first hear, what does Andrew do? Grab his brother. He, Grab his brother, yeah. yeah. He goes and he finds his brother. Would you read that for us, Gary? Sure. In John chapter 1. Okay. John chapter 1, verse 40 and 41. And by the way, John should know because he was there with Andrew. John chapter 1, verses 40 and 41. Okay. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. John 1, 40 and 41. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. First thing, let me go find my sibling, yes. whose name was Simon, Simon, right? Now, go over to Mark 1, and the circle expands a little bit more. Mark chapter 1. Thomas, could you read for us Mark 1, verses 29 to 31? Sure. Mark 1, 29 to 31. This is from New King James Version. Now, as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife, mo wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. So he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And immediately the fever left her, and she served them. I like that. They told him about her <laughs> at once. Yeah. At once. Yeah. Like, okay, we're going to, by the way, after the sun goes down, it says the whole city showed up. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But what have Andrew and Peter, or Simon Peter, his first name is actually Simon, right? Mm -hmm. What have Andrew and Simon Peter decided? Share the blessing. Yeah. First mission field? Home. 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 Is it home? So, anybody want to share a testimony that God, where God put that conviction on your heart, mm. that your first mission field is your home, Renella? Yeah, you know, um, I have a wonderful family, um, and there are times that I, you know, try to. When I first kind of was converted, I was very excited and would try to to share the gospel with my words. And I started realizing that it's it's much more important to to start off sharing with your actions. Mm -hmm. And uh, and eventually God opens up those opportunities. So for example, at the beginning I had to learn that I just need to show my love by doing the dishes and doing all the hard work and not trying to get out of it, but over here telling them about Jesus. You know, that's, that's mm -hmm. all backwards. And it spoke more to them by, by me doing selfless things that I normally wouldn't do. Um, and, and God has opened up those opportunities as I've gone on. Um, and I could share more on that, but, but it's, yeah, sometimes it depends on the family and where they're at. And uh, yeah, so. So, yeah, I want to come back to some other examples of that. But Chelsea, where, yeah, for me, family is the mission field. Right, yeah, for me, I definitely have um, some relatives who actually um, either don't believe in God or who, um, I guess, have a, are in a rough place in their walk with God. And for me, um, I became just really convicted that my prayer for myself is to embody 1 Corinthians 13, mm -hmm. to embody what love is, Jesus' love, really, to them. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and make that really my, my first witness. And when those conversations about Jesus open up to, to start having those conversations after my life has been that witness to them. So that really ties in with what Ronella is right. saying, you know, mm -hmm. be a witness for Jesus, yeah. use words if necessary, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, Travis, you've, you've been on mission assignments in many parts of the world, right? You've been to the Philippines, you've been to Guyana, you've probably been other Af I don't know where you've been. But but God has also placed on your heart a special burden for mission to your own family. You want to share an experience uh, with that um, when you became a Christian that God just put that on your heart? And we, it's funny, we were just talking about that this morning. Melena and I were talking about this uh, with a friend and 
I think I was like Renella at first. It was, um, you know, you tried to pull and drag if kicking, you know, and, uh, and I learned, it took a while, but I learned, it was important to me. I wanted more than anything, I wanted them to fall in love with Jesus, but, but sh showing them who Jesus was, and that took some time, and, and you just had to back off, mm -hmm. show them who Jesus was, and, and grow together as a family, and that's worked a lot better mm -hmm. than, uh, than, the, than the alternative. But I think family is the most important. Can you imagine being in heaven without right your now. family? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You shared with me one time, and I'm impressed to ask you to share again about your relationship with your mother mm -hmm. and how God gave you the opportunity to go and give Bible studies to your mother. Right. I, uh, we didn't have a good relationship growing up. And uh, when we were separated for some time and brought back together, my, uh, my mother and I started working on that, but it was towards the end of her life, which was just a few years ago, that uh, I asked her if she was going to be, if she thought she was going to be in heaven, and she started crying and said, mm -hmm. I don't think so, I have not been good enough. Mm -hmm. And so... So she didn't understand the gospel message. She didn't. And so I started studying with her. It was a set of 25 studies, <laughs> and she's just weeping as, I'm, as we're studying the first couple of times as she realizes that it's not about how good she is, Ooh, it's about amen. how good Jesus is. Amen. amen. And, and uh, we got to about the end of 20 studies, and then she died unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but she had told people in the church, she said, mm -hmm. I learned more... In, tw in 20 studies than I did in 63 years, and wow. she had wanted to be rebaptized. So wow. um, I, I believe that when, when the day when Jesus comes, I'm going to see her. Amen. 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 Melena, I know that you're a new Christian too, and you've actually spent some time recently getting training to study the Bible with people. Do you ever think when you're doing that, I've got family members that don't know Jesus? Yeah, that's a big thing for me. Um, just over the past year becoming a Christian, I've been just trying to lead by example. It's been hard because I've been in Australia, so the only time they've seen me is over FaceTime. Mm. But I actually just recently started um, Bible studies with my brother who's been an atheist for as long as I can mm. remember. Mm. <laughs> and um, I don't know if he's doing with them with me because I'm his little sister and he doesn't want to hurt my feelings. <laughs> that's <laughs> but, okay, right? <laughs> yeah, but he has so many questions like a study that I do in 15 minutes with somebody he wants to do for an hour because he has so many questions and it's so beautiful and my sister she's starting to ask questions and she's making sure that my two-year-old niece uh, says her prayers every evening and it's just been such a blessing seeing how just being an example and showing people I think the biggest testimony is um, the evidence of a changed life yes. and that's what's speaking to my family and yeah, just like Travis said, I want my family in heaven more than anything, and Amen. I can't imagine spending eternity without them. Mm -hmm. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was it. That was all we needed to hear, right? <laughs> to, to be studying the Bible with your, brother, with your brother who's been a professed atheist, and he has more questions than anybody else you've studied with. I mean, that's a miracle of God, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. and, and to show him that you not only want the world to know the love of God, but you want him to know the love of God, right? Mm -hmm. And your sister too. And your little niece, right? Mm -hmm. You want her to know the love of God too. That's a powerful, powerful testimony. Um, you are, and this takes me to, to another thought as we're talking about ministering to our families. You are a mentor to your siblings, right? Mm -hmm. What's a mentor? Anybody? Mm. What's a mentor? Someone we who talked just... about it in the previous study, didn't yeah. we, Chelsea? Someone who... I guess just kind of coaches you through life, whether it's through your, your spiritual walk or just general life. And, and the most effective mentor is someone who done it before. lives what they're talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, they, they, they live that. So you, they watch, mm -hmm. they watch. Not, not in a critical, judgmental way, but, oh, okay, this is how a Christian lives. Mm -hmm. Kyle? Yeah, and I was just going to add, just going back to what we were talking about too. Sometimes we think that our families... <laughs> Um, that they may not be interested mm -hmm. to hear what we have to say. But I found, and you know, I'm, I've done ministry in different places and stuff, but just recently we've been studying with my brothers, and I've been so amazed at how open and how much they wanted to learn mm -hmm. the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I realized, man, you know, here I was, I've been working over here and over here and over here, but right in, my, in front of me were people 
that were really hungry for the Word of God. Now you say brothers, is that kind of a generic brother? Or is that actually no, your brothers? Actual, I have yeah. my actual brothers mm -hmm. in Tennessee, and I, mm -hmm. I've just been amazed at how hungry they were for the Word of God. And, and so I think sometimes we, we forget that the people that God puts right in front of us may be the ones that need mm -hmm. us most. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And perhaps the ones who will be most open because they, they know we love them and we care about them rather than just a stranger coming up. Chelsea and then Thomas. Right, yeah, just resonating with, with what's been said. I, my husband and I um, did some Bible studies with his grandparents mm -hmm. and wow. I found that, you know, you can be a spiritual mentor even to someone who's older than you because sure. um, they, even though they're much older than we are, they never studied the Bible before and they actually were excited to learn. So that was really a, a, a blessing for I and my husband to, to have those Bible studies and almost at least give some kind of spiritual insight for them. That's beautiful. Yeah. That reminds me of a testament, and I'll come to your point, Thomas, of, uh, of a young preacher named Taj, who's a friend of mine. And Taj says, my, my grandpa held me mm. when I was dedicated, right? When I was born? Yeah. No, when I was born, sorry. Mm -hmm. And, and then he said, I hold, held my grandpa when he was born again. Because he had the privilege of baptizing his oh, grandpa. Yeah. Study, but, that's you know, awesome. He held me when I was born. I held him when he was born again. Mm -hmm. So that's amazing. Would you agree that our family is an important mission field for yes. us? Yes. Right. Yeah, right. Thomas? I'll just add, I have a family member who also is an atheist, and I really want to reach out to him. But he doesn't. He knows a lot about the Bible, actually. <laughs> it's just that for whatever reason, he turned his, his heart away from God. But I feel like, for me, if I keep arguing with him about the Bible, it's not going to go anywhere. But I just, I just try to treat him like Jesus would. Mm -hmm. like, he's like He's my brother, and he's someone I love in, unconditionally, regardless of his beliefs. And I think that's going to speak more to him than anything else. Amen. Amen. Yes, uh, Haiti. And then, by the way, we got lots of interaction. That's good, right? Because this is real life, yes. isn't it? Mm -hmm. This is where the gospel impacts mm. right at home. Mm -hmm. Haiti? Um, for me, I'm a mother of two. And ever since I had the first one, God just put a burning fire in my heart to teach my children about Him. And um, mm -hmm. to know the importance that I can mold and shape them, you know, their relationship with God, even though they have to choose on their own, that's mm -hmm. individual, but that I have a special role, my husband and I, but especially myself as their mother. And, and so for me, this is just like so personal. You know, I try in many ways to teach them his word, to teach them, you know, how to praise him, how to worship him and the why. And um, to try to model it, I, may, I make mistakes. And when I do, I also apologize, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I let them know, you know, I'm still on a journey myself. Mm -hmm. But for me, this is just very important. Would you, would you go to the text in Deuteronomy, Haiti, for us, yeah. Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7? Because what Haiti described there is what is written in Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm listening and thinking, I hope your children are watching. And they go, oh, mom loves me. And she wants me to know Jesus, right? Uh, that's, that, that puts it all together for them. Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 and 7. I'll be reading from the New King James Version, and it says, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Amen. Amen. Any teachers here? Anybody have taught groups of people? What happens when you teach to someone? Mm. You when teach you yourself teach too. That's right. Mm. right. You teach yourself too. You reinforce in your own heart. And maybe the Spirit says, don't forget what you just told them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. yeah. you know, remember to live that way yourself, right? Mm -hmm. um, one other text, in, and we, we talked about this idea of modeling, right? 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1. Pedro, if you could read that for us, yes. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1. The Apostle Paul is speaking. I'll be reading from the King New, New King James Version. And it says, Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Anyone else have another translation that translates the words imitate differently? 
Oh. Uh, Chelsea, what does yours say? English Standard Version. It's also be imitators of me. Be meaning. imitators. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anyone use another word? Follow. Follow. Followers. Mm -hmm. You know, followers is not really as, as helpful a trans translation. Uh, the, the word is mimic. Oh. Mm -hmm. That's the verb in, in Greek. Yeah? So, so really it's follow my example. Mm -hmm. Not just follow, but actually be an imitator of me. But... We're not trying to make little us's, right? That's not good English, is it? <laughs> We're not trying to make little replicas of us, but follow me as I follow, as I follow, as I follow Jesus. Yeah. So there's that primary mission field um, in our home. Anyone else that God put a burden on your heart? Yes, Pedro, the, the, this is your mission, field, your home. Well, I, I see the, you know, and my daughter, you know, she's uh, eight months old, and she's a very observant girl. She looks at everything, and she's <laughs> looking at every action I take. Many of the time, and she's looking at me or, the, or her mother. And and when I look at her, you know, she's a little child, eight year, eight, eight months old, and she's observing what I do. Mm -hmm. Now, every time I pick up my phone, she notices, and I, I have to mm -hmm. think of myself how, how much I'm going to spend on because she's she's looking at me. She's recording your she's phone time. Morning, my phone. <laughs> oh, yeah. morning, my phone is doing it. Right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So you're saying before she can even speak back and say, why are you doing that? She's observing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, Renella? Yeah, um, I think sometimes a lot of us have a really deep desire to uh, you know, reach our family, um, but sometimes it's not possible in the, whether you're geographically apart or, or whatever it might be. But um, I had an experience about, oh, I don't know how many years ago, maybe three or four years ago now, where I had a real big burden to pray for my extended family. And I realized, you know, I don't know how to reach them, but I can pray for them. Mm -hmm. And I can really, really pray for them. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I created, I needed a way to just remember all of them because it's a big family. So I created this PowerPoint with their pictures and I would just go through the PowerPoint wow. and pray. That's very intentional. So, so I could see their face. Yeah. And I remember I, anytime I could, I just prayed and prayed for months. And I remember little by little God, um, answering prayers so specifically um, in my Filipino family's life in the Philippines. Okay. And long story short, my one of my aunts um, kind of just, her life sort of just all of a sudden changed and um, she, I, I was able to connect her to a, a, a pastor from my church um, and she, she had come to live in San Francisco and she got she got Bible studies, she got baptized, her family, um, you know, was interested as well. And now she mm. watches Hope, Hope's Out of School. Well, wait, why? Yeah, right? Totally, yeah. exactly. um, wow. and, and her daughter watches it as well. And it's just That's incredible amazing. because I don't know if several years ago I would have thought that their family would have really right. come to God. But um, she can even mm. testify herself how God has just changed her life. And she's so happy now. So Amen. prayer, even if we feel like we can't, don't have the words Prayer does so much. Mm -hmm. But it's not just God bless the people of the world, but you had PowerPoint slides with pictures mm -hmm. and names, mm -hmm. very specific mm -hmm. intercession. And one of the areas that we might really be wanting to intercede is the last section of our study here as we're talking about what do people see in our house is what do we do if there's someone living in our house who is not a follower of Jesus? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the last section we want to look at together. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's look at a couple of texts of Scripture that give us some counsel. Nicole, if you could read for us 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians 7 talks, talks all about marriage and relationships. But in, in part of this chapter, Paul talks about, well, let's just say there were lots of members of the church in Corinth who were new believers, right? Mm -hmm. They'd been worshiping at the temple of Aphrodite and they became followers of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So what do you do if your whole family doesn't make that decision? Mm -hmm. Let's see what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 7, excuse me, verses, uh, let's see, where, how many verses did 12, we have there? 12 through verses 15. 12 to 15. Thank the, you. The New International Version says, To the rest I say this, I, not the Lord. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her, hus through her believing husband. 
Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or the sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. Mm. So situation where we might call this a divided mm. family. Mm. Now, if the person, maybe we should answer this question right now. If the person says, hey, I've met this really cute fellow or this really wonderful young lady. I'm looking for a single person here. <laughs> Still single, Kyle. Oh, uh, though you wonder, the wonderful young lady you met is sitting right next to you, I know. Wow. But um, who says, you know, he's not a believer, but, but he's so good to me. Mm. She's not a believer, but she's, she's just sweeter to me than anyone has ever been. Yeah, would, uh, would, mm. would the Apostle Paul give the same counsel we just read here? So. Stay in the relation. What do you think, Kyle? I don't think so. I think he's talking about people that are already married, they're already, and then the person becomes a believer. Okay. I, don't think, I don't think Paul would uh, encourage dating evangelism, probably. Yeah. <laughs> dating evangelism, yeah. okay. Yeah. But, but, you know, they're already husband and wife, and then one, well, the husband or the wife becomes a believer. That seems to be what, what he's talking about. Yeah. So um, being friends with an unbeliever is okay, but you're saying dating them, hoping that they'll become a believer is not a good way of going about it. I mean, God uses things, but probably not the best strategy. Yeah. Rather a circle of friendship, they come to faith, you find someone who loves God and loves you, yeah. that's the circle from which to find someone. So you're saying these are people who are in a committed relationship, married relationship, don't abandon them, basically, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Why? It's so, kind of an interesting passage, Thomas. Why, yeah. why does he say don't just, just leave? Because they don't believe in Jesus as well, I mean, Savior. It's, I think it is a model of what God would do. We are modeling God's love to each other. And so if we abandon each other, then what does that say about our God? And I, I like to think that God sticks I mean, just as God is committed to us, we should be committed to each other mm -hmm. uh, and um, through the thick and thin. And, and hopefully what would happen, Stephanie? That the unbelieving spouse would come to a, a living relationship with Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm. Chelsea? Yeah, and I've actually, in my family, have seen so many stories of how um, my dad, who became an Adventist, um, but my mom, once they were married, she was an Adventist, but she saw the witness of my father and their family and she wanted to become an Adventist. Or like a great aunt of mine who also witnessed to her husband so that he also became a believer. Like I just think of so many stories where the spouse was able to witness to their unbelieving spouse who, who because of their love, wanted to know more about this God whom they loved so much. Because they saw it uh, acted out. They, they saw it in action, Thomas? Yeah, I just want to put a caveat here, if that's okay. I, I think what I don't want to say is that people should just subject themselves to abuse simply because they're trying to mm. evangelize their partner. Mm. I mean, there should be boundaries, obviously. So sure. if someone's hurting you, you got to protect yourself. But as, with that being said, if that's not an issue, then yeah, let's do what we can to reach out and, and show love to the person. Sure, nice sure. Parents. Sean, and then I have a little story. Oh, that's fine. I was just going to say... Uh, we shouldn't leave the kids out of the picture as well. Right, so it's not just spouse, but children too, right? Right, because, because as well, you don't know what impact that will have on a child's life because then they might abandon God because they feel, well, this person just walked out on their spouse, so what kind right. of love does that show? Mm -hmm. so right. We have to so be don't careful. be in church so much that you abandon your children, mm -hmm. right? right? Mm -hmm. I remember mm -hmm. an evangelist told me one time, a lady came to him, she said, you got to reach my husband. I've been trying to get him to church for years and years, and he won't come. And the evangelist said, what does your husband like? And she said, he loves cake. He said, go home and bake him a cake. And when he comes home, have him find a comfortable place to sit. Ask him how his day has been. Give him some cake. And she gave her some very practical instructions. She went back and followed them. And before long, the, the husband came to the meetings. He said, I don't know what you're talking about here, but my wife is sweeter than she ever has been. <laughs> That's practical, isn't it? Yes. That's practical. One last text I want to go to. Uh, Chelsea, if you could read for us sure. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. Um, and we may apply this to all different types of relationships, including marriage, perhaps. 2 Corinthians mm -hmm. 6 and verse 14. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. 
For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? You think this is talking about marriage? Or is it talking about other types of relationships? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Even, even oh. friendship. I, yeah. <laughs> Even, Even friend a friendship? Mm -hmm. yeah. Could it be marriage too? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Business. Business. Yeah. business? <laughs> yeah, I think someone said to me, don't go into a business partnership with an unbeliever. They have different values. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. That's going to be challenging for That's you. That's right. Yeah. So don't be unequally yoked. Uh, another place in 1 Corinthians 7, marry in the Lord. Mm. What does that mean? Mm. Marry in the Lord. We're talking about our family is a place of hospitality and witness. Would you say marrying the Lord means in harmony with the will of the Lord? Mm. or You're both committed yeah. to the Lord. Kyle? I think you're both committed to Jesus. You both love Jesus and in, so, a in a relationship with Jesus. And that's, that's what we would describe, I guess, as equally, equally. yoked. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't mean you're the same, right. mm -hmm. but you have the same commitment direct. to Jesus. Jesus. Sean? I was just going to say you're going in the same direction. In the same direction. Yeah. Yeah. In the same direction. Well, this is practical. Some of you have been watching our study today and you say, well, we have a lot to learn. Mm -hmm. God, how can I make my home a place of hospitality and witness? Some of you may have come under conviction. I have people right in front of me, maybe brothers or sisters or grandparents who need to know there's a God who loves them. That should be my first mission field. And it's good to have the mission trips so far away, but let's not forget mm. close at home, uh, our primary mission field. And especially if you have a loved one who doesn't know Jesus. Could we pray the love of God just flow through us in amazing ways? Amen. Amen. And that they would say, tell me about this amazing God who's changed your life and filled you with his love. Let's pray that can happen in our families. Mm. Our Father in heaven, we've been challenged today a story of an ancient king who forgot to say, my house should be a place where people can see God and not my stuff. Oh, Lord, may it be in our homes that people will come to know you, especially those within our own circle and especially those who don't know you yet. Lord, thank you that you'll guide our steps and fill us with your love as we walk with you this day and each day. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Well, thanks for joining us for Hope Sabbath School. I want to go out and be a better person for Jesus, not to earn his love, but because he loves us with an immeasurable and unfailing love. Let his love flow through you to bless your family so that they can be with you in his eternal kingdom. 